Hello. This is Nelson Olmsted. The National Broadcasting Company presents Story for Tonight. Mankind has always enjoyed a good story. It was that way in the beginning, when our ancestors gathered around campfires to hear accounts of adventure. Today, we can enjoy the finest tales ever written, the result of thousands of years of experience. And we don't gather around the campfire, but around the radio. This series of programs is designed to bring to life for you the most compelling and dramatic short stories that have ever been written. Here is your teller of tales, Nelson Olmsted. Thank you, Hugh Downs. Sir Niall Dubray once said, Here is the egotist's code. Everything for himself, nothing for others. In our story for tonight, there's a man named Mr. Trim who built his whole life in this code of the egotist. You must be a pretty ruthless character then, Nelson. Who wrote the story? Irvin S. Cobb, Hugh. Oh, you mean this is going to be a comedy? And not at all. While it's true that Cobb is best remembered today as a humorist, he also wrote some of the most powerful and compelling stories in our language. And this is the story of five days in an arrogant man's life and how those days changed his character completely. It's entitled, The Escape of Mr. Trim. Mr. Trim was president of the late 13th National Bank. But what he was is not so important as what he is now. Mr. Trim, as his lawyer described him, was all chill steel and brains. He'd been called the Iron Man of Wall Street. And all during his trials, the newspapers had filled columns describing him. He was a haughty man. And even during the time he was in the tombs, he maintained his sense of aloofness to everything and everybody. He began to change first when Deputy Marshal Myers came to take him to the federal prison. It was the handcuffs. Somehow he hadn't anticipated the handcuffs. He kept thinking of a phrase, the grips of the law. The grips of the law were upon Mr. Trim, and he felt them now for the first time. Sudden sweat beaded out on his face, turning it slick and wet. The trip to the train was a horror for Mr. Trim because of the staring, jabbering people. There is no crueler thing than a city crowd, all eyes and morbid curiosity. Mr. Trim gave mental thanks to a deity whose existence he thought he'd forgotten when the gate of the train shed clanged hut, uh, shut behind him, shutting out the mob that had come with him all the way. Cameras had been shoved in his face like gun muzzles. Reporters had scuttled alongside him, dodging under Meyer's pending arm to shout questions in his ears. He had neither spoken nor looked at them. The sweat still ran down his face so that when finally he raised his head in the comparative quiet of the train shed, his skin was a curious gray under the jail paleness, like the color of wet wood ashes. I reckon we'd uh, better get on the smoker, said Myers, if there's room there. Mr. Trim was steered back along the length of the train through a double row of pop-eyed porters and staring trainmen. The club car was full of shirt-sleeved men who stood up craning their necks and stumbling over each other in their desire to see him. These men came out into the aisle, so that Myers had to shove through them. This here will do as well as any, I guess, said Myers, settling himself in the stuffy plush seat and breathing deeply, like a man who had got through the hardest part of a not easy job. He drew a newspaper from his pocket, opened it out flat, and spread it over Mr. Trim's lap, so that it covered the chained wrists. Almost instantly, the train was in motion. In three hours, they would be at the prison. <laughs> 
was late afternoon. They were sliding through woodlands with occasional openings which showed meadows melting into wide flat lands. Deputy Meyer said, You want a drink? No? Well, I guess I'll have a drop myself. The traveling fills a fellow's throat full of dust. He got up, lurching to the motion of the flying train, and started forward to the water cooler behind the car door. He'd gone perhaps two-thirds of the way when Mr. Trim felt a queer, grinding sensation beneath his feet. The forward end of the car slewed out of its straight course, tilting up. There was a grinding, roaring, grating sound, and before Mr. Trim's eyes, Myers vanished, tumbling forward out of sight as the car floor buckled under his feet. Then, as everything, the train, the earth, the sky, all fused together in a great spatter of white and black, Mr. Trim shot through the air over the seat backs, his chained hands aloft, clutching wildly. He rolled out of a ragged opening, flopped gently on the sloping side of the right-of-way, and slid easily to the bottom where he lay quiet and still on his back in a bed of weeds and wild grass, staring straight up. How many minutes he lay there, Mr. Trim didn't know. It may have been the shrieks of the victims or the glare from the fire that brought him out of the daze. He wriggled his body to a sitting posture, got on his feet, holding his head between his coupled hands, and gazed full-faced into the crowning railroad horror of the year. Nobody paid any attention to Mr. Trim as he stood swaying upon his feet. There wasn't a scratch on him. His clothes were hardly rumpled. His hat was still in his head. He stood a minute, and then... Moved by a sudden impulse, he turned around and went running straight away from the railroad at, a, at the best speed his pudgy legs could accomplish, with his arms pumping up and down in front of him and his fingers interlaced. It was a grotesque gait, almost like a rabbit hopping on its hind legs. Instantly, almost, the friendly woods growing down to the edge of the fill swallowed him up. He dodged and doubled back and forth among the tree trunks, his small patent leather feet skipping nimbly over the irregular turf, until he stopped for lack of wind in his lungs to carry him into the rod. When he got his breath back, Mr. Trim leaned against a tree and bent his head this way and that, listening. No sound came to his ears except the sleepy call of birds and the crickets. As well as Mr. Trim might judge, he'd come far into the depths of a considerable woodland. Already the shadows under the low limbs were growing thick and confused as the hurried twilight of early September came on. Mr. Trim sat down on a natural cushion of thick green moss between two roots of an oak. The place was clean and soft and sweet-scented. For some little time, he sat there motionless in a sort of mental daze. Then his round body slowly slid down flat upon the moss his head lolled to one side, and, the reaction having come, Mr. Trim's limbs all relaxed, and he went to sleep. After a while, when the woods were black and still, the half-grown moon came up, and sifting through a chink and canopy of leaves above, shone down full on Mr. Trim as he lay snoring gently with his mouth open and his hands rising and falling on his breast. The moonlight struck upon the little giant handcuffs, making them look like quicksilver. Toward daylight, it turned off sharp and cool. The dogwoods, which had been a solid color at nightfall, now showed pink in one light and green in another, like changeable silk, as the first level rays of the sun came up over the rim of the earth and made long golden lanes between the tree trunks. Mr. Trim opened his eyes slowly. Of escape, he had no thought. The hue and cry must be out for him before now. Doubtless men were already searching for him. But 
perhaps he could get the handcuffs off and so go to meet his captors in some manner of dignity. Strange that the idea hadn't occurred to him before. It seemed to Mr. Trim that he desired to get his two hands apart more than he'd ever desired anything in his whole life before. But it didn't take Mr. Trim long to find out that they were not to be got off. He tugged and pulled, trying with his fingers for a purchase. And all he did was to chafe his skin and make his wrists throb with pain. The cuffs would go forward just so far, and then the little humps of bone above the hands would catch and hold them. Mr. Trim was not a man to waste time in the pursuit of the obviously hopeless. Presently he stood up, shook himself, and started off at a fair gate through the woods. In a little while he came out upon the railroad. As nearly as he could judge, he'd come out of cover at least two miles above the scene of the wreck. On the track was a newspaper. The front page was uppermost, and he knew it must be the morning's issue, for across the column tops ran the flaring headline, Twenty Dead in Frightful Collision. Squatting on the cinder track, Mr. Trim patted the crumpled sheets flat with his hands. And then his heart gave a great bound inside of him. There, in staring black face type, was his own name leading the list of known dead. And then he read the short, choppy paragraphs. The body of the United States Deputy Marshal Myers, frightfully crushed, had been taken from the wreckage of the smoker. And near to Myers, another body, with features burned beyond recognition, had been found and identified as that of Hobart W. Trim, the convicted banker. Mr. Trim read the account through to the end, and as he read, the sense of dominant, masterful self-control came back to him in waves. He was as good as free. There would be no hunt for him now, no alarm out, no posse combing every scrap of cover for a famous criminal turned fugitive. He had only to lie quiet for a few days somewhere and then get in secret touch with Wheeling, his attorney. Wheeling would do anything for money, and Trim had the money, four millions and more, cannily saved from the crash that had ruined so many others. He would alter his personal appearance, change his name, and with Wailing's aid, he would get out of the country and into some other country, where a man might live like a prince on four millions or the fractional part of it. Between this prospect and Mr. Trim, there stood nothing in the way, nothing but handcuffs. The grips of the law were still upon him. Mr. Trim didn't know much about picking a lock. He'd got his money by a higher form of burglary that didn't require knowledge of lock picking. He worked with deliberate slowness, steadily. Nevertheless, it was hot work. The sun rose over the bank and shone on him through the limbs of the uprooted tree. His hat was on the ground alongside of him. The sweat ran down his face, streaking it and wilting his collar flat. The scrap of metal he was using kept slipping out of his wet fingers. Down would go the chained hands to scrabble in the grass for it, and then the picking would go on again. This happened a good many times. The handcuffs remained locked. The devilish, stupid malignity of the blasted things. Mr. Trim raised his hands and brought them down in the log violently. There was a double click, and the cuffs tightened painfully, pressing the chafed red skin white. Mr. Trim snatched up his hands close to his nearsighted eyes and looked. One of the little notches on the underside of each cuff had disappeared. It was as if they were living things that had turned and bitten him for the blow he gave them. From the time the sun went down, there was a tingle of frost in the air. Mr. Trim didn't sleep much. Under the squeeze of the tightened fetters, his wrists throbbed steadily, and racking cramps ran through his arms. His stomach felt as though it were tied into knots. The water that he drank from the creek only made his hunger sickness worse. His undergarments, that had been wet with perspiration, clung to him clamorly. 
his middle-aged, tenderly cared-for body called through every pore for clean linen and soap and water and rest as his empty insides called for food. Soon after sunrise, Mr. Trim was off again, wandering without purpose, until he came to a clearing. Near the center of it rose the sagging roof of what had been a shack or a shed of some sort. Stooping cautiously to keep his bare head below the tops of the shoemax, Mr. Trim made for the ruined shanty and gained it safely. In the midst of the rotted, punky logs that had once formed the walls, he began scraping with his feet. Presently, he uncovered something. It was a broken-off harrow tooth, scaled like a long red fish with the crusted rust of years. Mr. Trim rested the lower rims of the handcuffs on the edge of the old broken watering trough and worked the pointed end of the harrow tooth into the flat middle link of the chain as far as it would go. And then, with one hand on top of the other, he pressed forward with all his might. The, the pain in his wrists made him stop it at once. The link had not sprung or given him the least, but the twisting pressure had almost broken his wrist bones. He let the harrow tooth fall knowing that it would never serve as a lever to free him. And he sat on the side of the trough, rubbing his wrists and thinking. He had another idea. It came into his mind as a vague suggestion that fire had certain effects upon certain metals. He kindled a fire of bits of rotted wood. And when the flames ran together and rose slender and straight in a single red thread, he thrust the chain into it, holding his hands as far apart as possible in the attitude of a player about to catch a bounced ball. But immediately, the pain of that grew unendurable, too, and he leaped back, jerking his hands away. He had succeeded only in blackening the steel and in putting a big water blister on one of his wrists, right where the shackle bolt would press upon it. Staggering a little and putting his feet down unsteadily, Mr. Trim left the clearing, heading as well as he could tell, eastward, away from the railroad. Two days later, at a point about five miles north of where the collision had occurred, a tramp was busy, just before sundown, cooking something in an old wash boiler that perched precariously in a fire of wood coals. At the sound of the halting footsteps of Mr. Trim, the tramp stopped stirring and glanced up apprehensively. As he took in the figure of the newcomer, his eyes narrowed, and his pasty, nasty face spread in a grin of comprehension. He said... Well, well, well. Welcome to our city, little stranger. Mr. Trim came nearer, dragging his feet, for they were almost out of the wrecks of his patent other shoes. His gaze shifted from the tramp's face to the stuff in the fire, his nostrils wrinkling. And then slowly he said, I'm in trouble. And he held out his hands. Well, what I'd call a mild way of putting it. <laughs> Yeah, that peculiar kind of jewelry ain't generally worn for pleasure. Uh, are, are you sure there ain't nobody looking for you? I'm all alone. I want your help of getting these things, these things off and sending a message to a friend. You'll be well paid very well. I can pay you more money than you've ever had in your life. I can promise... He broke off for the tramp, as if reassured by his words had stooped again to his cooking and was stirring the bubbling contents of the wash water with a peeled stick. The smell of a stew, rising strongly, filled Mr. Trim with such a sharp and, and aching hunger that he couldn't speak for a moment. He mastered himself, but the effort left him shaking and gulping. Go on, then. Tell us something about yourself, said the freckled man. What brings you roaming around this here railroad cup with them bracelets on? I was in a wreck. The man with me, the officer, was killed. I wasn't hurt, and I got away into these woods. But they think I'm dead, too. My name is Trim. Trim? The New York banker? Yeah. Well, what a streak of luck. <laughs> Let me look at you. <laughs> Trim, the swell financier. <laughs> well, if this ain't rich. I... I've been wandering about here for a great many hours. 
Several days, I think it must be. And I need rest and food very much indeed. I don't... I don't feel very well. You don't look so well. That's a fact, Trim. But sit down, make yourself at home. After a while, we'll have a bite of food together, you and me. You'll be well paid. My friend will see to that. What I want you to do is to take the money in my pocket and buy a cold chisel or a file, any tool that would cut these things off me. Then you will send a telegram to a gentleman in New York and let me stay with you until we get an answer, until he comes. He will pay you well. I promise it. <laughs> Look who's given orders. Don't hand me that stuff, Trim. I don't trust you for nothing. I got a better plan. What do you mean? I mean this. I got a little rap or two hanging over my own head. If I take you into town, turn you over to the sheriff, I'll be a hero. They'll forget their matters. This ain't bad, Trim. Ain't bad at all. Oh, no, you don't. You don't get away, Trim. Come on. You're going along with me. We'll see what kind of a bargain I can strike up at the marshal. Come on now. Come on peaceable if you don't want to get hurt. Of a sudden, Mr. Trim became the primitive man. He was filled with those elemental emotions that make a man see in spatters of crimson. Gathering strength from passion out of an exhausted frame, he sprang forward at the tramp. He struck him with his head, his shoulders, his knees, his manacled wrists all at once. Caught by surprise, the freckled man staggered back, clawing the air, tripped on the wash boiler in the fire, and fell, striking his head on a large stone. He was out, out cold. And he probably would be, long enough to give Mr. Trim a chance to get away. In spite of his muddled condition, Trim reasoned that the tramp would not now go to the police. Because without Trim as a hostage, he would be thrown in jail himself. And Mr. Trim reasoned right. Because later, when the tramp staggered up, his head throbbing with great globs of pain, he had no more stomach for this affair. His only thought was to catch a fast freight and to get away. That night, it rained. A cold, steady autumnal downpour. A huddled figure slowly climbed upon a low fence, a low fence running along a house yard of a little farm. On a wet top rail, precariously perching, the figure slipped and sprawled forward in the miry yard. It got up, painfully swaying on its feet. It was Mr. Trim, looking for food. He moved slowly toward the house, tottering with weakness and because of the slick mud underfoot, peering nearsightedly this way and that through the murk, starting at every sound and stopping often to listen. The outlines of a lean-to kitchen at the back of the house were looming dead ahead of him when from the corner of the cottage sprang a small terrier. It made for Mr. Trim, barking shrilly. He backed away, kicking at the little dog, and then put one foot into a hot bed with a great clatter of breaking glass. He felt the sharp ends of the shattered glass tearing and cutting his skin as he jerked free. Recovering himself, he dealt the terrier a lucky kick under the throat that sent it back yowling to where it had come from. And then, as the door jerked open and a half-dressed man jumped out into the darkness, Mr. Trim half hobbled and half fell out of sight behind the wood pile. Back and forth, along the lower edge of his yard, the farmer hunted with a whimpering cowed terrier to guide him, poking in the dark corners of the yard with the muzzle of a shotgun for the unseen intruder whose coming had aroused the household. In a brush pile, just over the fence to the east, Mr. Trim lay on his face upon the wet earth with the rain beating down on him, sobbing with choking gulps that wrenched him cruelly, biting at the bonds on his wrists until the sound of breaking teeth gritted in the air. Finally, in the hopeless, helpless frenzy of his agony, he beat his arms up and down until the bracelet struck squarely on a flat stone and the force of the blow sent the cups home to the last notch so that they pressed harder and faster than ever upon the tortured wrist bones. was on a Tuesday evening. Early on a Saturday morning following, the chief of police in the town of Westfield, nine miles from the place where the collision occurred, 
heard a peculiar, strangely weak knocking at the front door of his cottage, where he also had his office. Opening the door, he saw a face framed in the opening. An indescribably dirty, unutterably weary face, with matted white hair and a rhyme of whitish beard stubble on the jaws. The eyes blinked weakly at the chief, from under lids as colorless as the eyelids of a corpse. The bare white head was filthy with plastered mud and twigs and dripping wet. The chief of police, startled at this apparition, said, Well, but hello there. Well, what do you want? I have come... I've come to surrender myself. I'm Hobart W. Trim. Well, I guess you've got another thing coming. When last seen, Hobart W. Trim was only 52 years old. Besides which, he's dead and buried. I guess maybe you'd better think again, uh, Grandpap, and see if you ain't uh, Methuselah, or the wandering Jew. I am Hobart W. Trim, the banker. Go on, prove it. Have you got any way to prove it? Yes. I have. Slowly, with struggling attempts, he raised his hands into the chief's sight. They were horribly swollen hands. And at the wrists, almost buried in the bloated folds of flesh, blackened, rusted, battered, yet still strong and whole, was a tightly locked pair of Bean's latest model little giant handcuffs. Great Lord! Come in and let me get them irons off you. Why, they must hurt some terrible. They can wait, said Mr. Trim, very feebly, very slowly, very humbly. I've worn them a long, long while. I'm used to them. First... Wouldn't you give me some food, please? You have just heard Irvin S. Cobb's short story, The Escape of Mr. Trim, as told by Nelson Armstead. Nelson, that was a very powerful story, and I'll admit I'm surprised it was written by Cobb. Yes, Hugh. Some of Cobb's very finest stories are his least known. <laughs> but they're all included in an anthology published a year or so ago entitled Cobb's Cavalcade. Well, Nelson, what about the story for next week? It concerns three familiar things, Hugh. A typical American small town, a young boy who is the star of the town's high school basketball team, <laughs> and the boy's father who sits on the sidelines and yet plays the game harder than his son. <laughs> oh, sir, there's nothing more exciting than a small town basketball That's game. right. Who wrote the story? Oh, well, Margaret Weymouth Jackson, who lives in a small Indiana town and knows whereof she speaks. It's a great comedy, Hugh, and yet it's so real that it'll bring back a lot of personal memories. So I hope everyone will make a note to be with us to hear Margaret Weymouth Jackson's story, The Hero. Until next Sunday night, then, this is Nelson Olmsted saying good night and good reading. The National Broadcasting Company has presented Story for Tonight, featuring your teller of tales, Nelson Olmsted, under the direction of Norman Felton. The orchestra was conducted by Joseph Felicio, with original music composed by Richard Shore. Hugh Down Street. Next week, don't miss The Hero on Story for Tonight. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.